I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. As we were singing that song, as we were worshiping just here, I imagine God saying the same thing to us. And so, you know, sometimes it's hard to think about God singing, but the Bible says he does. He rejoices over us with singing, but what if God was singing that song to us? I want more of you, Jason. I want more of you, Jason. What if he was singing that to you? I want more of you. I want more of you. I think that's what God, I think that, that's what God says to us. You know, I, it's not a, a condemning way, but he just wants more of our thoughts, more of our actions, more of our heart, more of our strength not in a way to wear us out or a way to condemn us or a way to make us feel bad, but when we give more to him, when we release more of ourselves to him, he can fill us up more. When we let go of ourselves, he comes and fills us up with who he is and makes us who he really created us to be. Let's just take a couple minutes here as we finish up worship. Let's just say, God, I give more of myself to you. Sometimes that's what it takes, is us giving more to God. The Bible says, he says that, that God draws near those who draw near to him. And as we get close to God, he comes close to us. So let's just take a minute or two and just say, God, I give more of myself to you. I give all that I am to you. Take my thoughts, take my words, take my actions. Change me. Make me like you. So let's just take a couple of minutes and just pray. Just here in the presence of God. Say, God, I give more of myself to you. ourselves to you, God, so that God, I can be filled with you, God. I give my life to you, God. I give myself to you. I give my heart to you, my thought, my time, my actions. God, I want to be close to you. God, I want all that you have for me. God, we give to you. God, and maybe it's just a little more than it was yesterday. Maybe it's not quite as much as tomorrow is going to be. But God, you're so faithful. Lord, to even in our small steps, you come all the way. So you come to us, God. And we just thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us and that all that is yours, we can have. All that you have to give, God, we receive. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your presence in our lives, God. Thank you for your love for us. God, we give you our heart. As we look at your word today, God, change us. Speak to our hearts. God, we give our hearts to you and say, God, do what you want in them. Have your way. I want more of you. You want more of me, God. Let's, let's meet together. So God, as we open your, wor your word today, God, change us, mold us, Make us like you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. What a great time in the presence of God.
Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to church. I want to say hi to everyone who's out there watching on your phone or your computer or your tablet or your TV, whether it's with your friends or your family or your small group, or even if you're just all by yourself, welcome to church. Welcome to church. This is the way that we're doing church nowadays. But I also want to remind all of you out there, if you guys are members of New Life Fellowship, we have small groups. Please don't neglect. Don't forget about meeting together in our small groups because that's where life is. That's where we find encouragement. We can pray together. We can continue in community. And even though maybe I can't meet you face to face, there are other leaders, there are other small group leaders who want to meet you face to face, who who want to pray with you and study the Bible together. And we want to continue to meet together, continue to grow, continue to be the body of Christ, even though we can't meet together as a big, big group right now. So I want to encourage you, if you don't have a small group, I want to encourage you to contact our offices, contact New Life Fellowship, because we have small groups all over the city, different parts all over the place. And uh, there's a small, there is a small group for you. So check that out. Today we're going to continue in our series in 1 Corinthians. Uh, we've been going through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 4 to 7, talking about love. 1 Corinthians 13 is the chapter of love. And it talks about, you know, if I, even if I have the tongues of men, speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am nothing. But 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7, is what we're focusing in on in this series. I'm just going to read it just as kind of a reminder for all of us. And just listen here. It says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. And that's the text of our series that we're going through right now. We've talked about how love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Today we're going to talk about two more points. And the points that we're going to talk about is love is not rude and love is not self-seeking. But before we get into that, as I was preparing for this message, I've just been thinking about some of the other verses in the Bible about love. And if any of you guys out there, you want to read more about love, Obviously, there's the full, um, the full chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 where you can read the whole chapter and read about what love is. But another good book of the Bible is the book of 1 John. It's only five chapters, but it talks about what love is. It talks about love and, and how we can be people, uh, Christians who love and show love to others and what it means to be someone who loves, and how love can affect our relationship with God. So if you want to know more about true love, agape love, God's love, then take a look at 1 John. I want to read one verse from 1 John. Uh, and it's 1 John 4, verse 8. And I want us to look at this verse together, but... Keep it in the back of our minds as we go through these points today. 1 John 4, 8, it's, it says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Let me say that again. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. This is the verse where we get the, the, the truth from that God is love, that God is love. But I want to look at the first part of this verse. It says, he who does not love. 
Now, we've been talking in 1 Corinthians 13 about how love is the agape love, the God's love, the commitment love. And sure enough, in this, in this verse, in 1 John 4, 8, that love is the same word, is the agape love of God. But it's not just an agape love that belongs to God. It's a, it's a commitment love that God has to us. But there are other verses in the Bible saying that we should love others in this same way. It talks about loving your enemies. It uses the agape, uh, the agape word, even when it's talking about husbands loving your wives. Uh, later on in different parts of the Bible where that, that same word is the agape love. So it's a love that God asks us to show to other people as well. But in 1 John 4, 8, it says, He who does not love, he who does not show the agape, commitment kind of love, does not know God. For God is the agape, commitment kind of love. And it's a very, very interesting word, or a very, very interesting verse, because it's almost like John is saying to us, if you have never loved in this way, then you don't truly understand God's heart of love. If you've never had to sacrifice in love, if you've never had to love commitment love for someone who doesn't love you, then you don't truly understand God's love. Now, obviously, God wants all of us to understand the depth and the greatness of his love. And sometimes God puts us in situations. God, he doesn't put us in bad situations. He doesn't create the bad situations. But, but sometimes in situations that we face, God says, this is an opportunity for you, to, for you to show that commitment kind of love to somebody. So in loving someone who doesn't love us back, we understand a little bit more about God's love for us. When a father has a daughter who is rebellious and does this and does that, and he still is faithful and shows love to her and, and shows kindness to her and shows that commitment style of love. When a Christian father is like this, then that Christian father starts to understand the depth and the true reality of God's love. When a brother loves another brother, even though that brother is off and doing his own thing and maybe living a life that's not pleasing to God, but that one Christian brother says, no, I'm going to continue to love. I'm going to continue to call them. I'm going to continue to text them, saying that they, you're still my friend. I want to hang out with you. Let's get together. Let's talk about the truth of God. Even when they reject us and say no to us, this verse here says that if we love in this way, we'll know God a little bit more. We'll know the heart of God. He who does not love, he who does not agape, show the agape love, does not know God, for God is love. And I think this is an invitation to us. It's an invitation to us as Christians, saying, God, we're God, God's saying to us, come on, Let's walk this journey of love together. Let's walk in a journey of love. And as I lead you down the road of your life, there's going to be people who don't deserve love. They're unkind. They're maybe unfriendly. Maybe they're your enemies. But he's saying, come on, I'm going to walk with you and show you how to love them. And as you do, I'm going to show you a little bit more about my heart, too. This is God's invitation to us. And God doesn't tell us just to ignore the people that are mean to us or forget about them or cut them out of our life. No, God says to love them. And yes, it's hard. God never said this kind of love is easy. It's difficult, yeah. But God says, as you do this, as we walk together, as you see 
as you see these things happen in your life and as you show more and more love, you're going to learn more and more about God's heart. And that's God's invitation to us as Christians, to live a life of love. Live on that journey with God, showing love, and as a result of that, understanding more about God, because God is love. So let's look at the two more points that we're going to talk about today from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is not rude, and love is not self-seeking. This word rude, that is translated rude in, in this verse, it's actually, it actually comes from a word that is very similar to the English word to scheme. Now, the word scheme, it means to, it means to, um, it means to create or to think of a plan in order to get something else to happen. You, you, you think about this plan and you have the end result because I'm doing this and this and this and this because I want that end result to happen. But the scheming part of it, it, it has the idea of I'm doing this in a, in a deceitful way in order to get something else. So when we say, when it says that love is not rude, it's not just talking about being polite. Yeah, being polite is good. Saying please and thank you, yeah, that's good. But the meaning of this word has the idea of scheming. So it says love does not scheme. Love does not try to get my own way by making plans and doing things, being deceitful. It's like, it's like playing games in a relationship. It's like, I'm doing this, and maybe I be, be kind to you in this way so that I can get something back from you, so that I can receive something that I want from you. And so I'm going to do this, and I'm going to be kind to you in this way, but it's not really a heart of kindness. It's because I want to get something for you. It's my selfishness that's causing me to do these things. And so that's the scheme. It's like, for like another example, would be somebody who flatters somebody else, gives them a nice compliment because they want to be thought well of. It's like, oh yeah, you look, you look handsome today, but really you want them to, to like you too, or you want them to, maybe you, you say, you compliment your boss. Yeah, you look really handsome today, thinking that he'll like you better. Maybe he'll give you a raise or a promotion or something like that. It's scheming, and it's doing nice things for people so that you can get something back for yourself. And that's what this word means. It says, so love does not scheme. Love does not do these things. Love does not play these tricks and play these games. But love is true and honest. So things like manipulation, flattery, deceit, thinking, how can I get them to do what I want them to do for me? And so maybe you take some of these steps, manipulate, flatter them, deceive them, in order to get what you want out of that relationship. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, this is not the way of love. The way of love is not deceiving, manipulation, flattery. This is not love. Let's think about God's relationship to us. God doesn't do this to us. God isn't kind to us so that we will lift our hands and worship him. Okay, that's not the way it works. God's not like, okay, if you, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. No, God's love is no strings attached. We could never do enough to earn the love of God. Because God's love never changes. God's love does not increase when we do good things for him. God's love does not decrease when we fail and sin and fall. God's love does not go up and down like a bumpy road. 
No, his love is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's love never changes. And so we can say that, you know, because God's love doesn't change, God's not a scheming God. And so we need to make sure that we are not rude, that we are not scheming in this way either. God does not do this to us. God's promises are always good and always true. If God said he's going to do something, don't try to make it happen. Say, okay, God, I'm going to give more money in the offering. I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. No, that's, that's, that, that, that's a very, very shallow relationship. If your relationship with God is just based on things you get, it's not a relationship. It's like going to a bank. God's not like that. God wants our hearts. God wants to give us. He wants to reveal to us his heart. And so in this love relationship that we have with God, let's get out of our mind that God's like this. He's not. His love is not a scheming kind of love. God doesn't promise one thing. He doesn't promise us anything to try to get us to act a certain way. If this, then this. No. But God is always faithful to his word. If his word says it, he is going to do it. And in regards to us in our lives, God wants us to be the same way. God wants us to live honest lives. Let's look at these verses in James chapter 5, verse 12. It says, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or, or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So God's talking about our relationship with other people. And don't... It's, you know, he, he says... Let your yes be yes. Let the words that you say be true to who you are. Live a life of integrity. The person that you are on the inside is the person that you are on the outside. What you say is who you truly are. Some people hide who they really are on the inside. But God says, no, I want you, your yes to be yes and your no to be no. Be honest. Don't be deceitful. Don't be flattery so that you can try to get your own way. Don't be scheming. Don't be rude. But be truthful and honest in love. Here's another verse. Ephesians 4, verse 25. God says, Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. So God says, speak the truth. Okay? Don't flatter, don't scheme so that you can try to get this. Don't say one thing that you think or feel so that you can get your own way. No, God says, speak the truth with your neighbor. Speak the truth with everybody, okay? Just be a person of integrity. So that's love is not rude. Love is truthful. It doesn't scheme to get our own way. It doesn't think just about ourselves but it thinks about others, and it thinks about God as well. It's interesting in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, in this passage that we're reading, there are so many of these things that are talking about selfishness. And love, if we want to summarize many of these points, love is not thinking about self. Love is thinking outside. Now, it's true that we got to take care of ourselves and provide and work hard and, and all that. That's good. You know, God, God expects us to do that. But in a relationship, a friendship, a love friendship, let's not be thinking about, okay, what can I get? What can he help? How can he help me? How can I get something out of this? How can something like this help me? No, let's get all of that out of our mind, all of the selfishness, and say, okay, I'm going to love like God loves. Love with commitment. The second point in 1 Corinthians 
13 that we're looking at today is love is not self-seeking. Self-seeking. Uh, other translation says love does not, I think, um, love does not seek their own benefit. Okay, love doesn't look to themselves. Okay, in this, in this translation it says love is not self, self-seeking. Now, there's a couple different times in the Bible when this word to seek is used, okay? So we're looking at not the self part of it, but the seeking part of it, the searching, the looking for it. And if we look just at the searching part of this word, okay? So the whole idea is looking for yourself or seeking, being self-seeking. But if we just look at the seeking part, the meaning of it, part of the meaning of it, it is used as a way, as a word to worship God, and it is also, in a bad sense, used to plot against someone's life. Okay? So there's two great extremes. One is worshiping God, and the other one is plotting against someone's life. So here, over here, the extreme is Okay, this word seeking, it means I'm searching for God. I'm seeking for God. I'm worshiping God. And over here, it's seeking to get someone's life, to murder, to kill, to, to conspire, to plot against somebody. Okay, so they're the two extremes. But the, if we want to summarize the meaning of this word, it means to search for something with all of our hearts. With everything, every part of our energy and our thoughts, I want it. I, I got to get it. I get, I, it's, it's, it's all that I can think about. It's all that, it, even when I sleep at night, I, I'm, I can't sleep because I'm thinking of it and dreaming about it and want this and trying to get it. That's what this word seeking means. It's a very, very strong, focused, and energetic seeking. Okay? So look at these examples. Here's one of the examples where this word to seek is used in the Bible. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. This is the story of when Jesus was born. Okay? And the, the wise men came. They visited Jesus. He was probably around two years old at this time. They came and visited Jesus. During the time they had visited Herod, uh, the, the wise men visited Herod and talked about where's this king of the Jews who's been born. And Herod's, all of a sudden, he's like, oh, I got to get rid of this guy because he's going to take, take the kingship away from me. And, and so Herod decided he's going to kill all of the children in Bethlehem two years old and, and younger. And listen to this verse. It says, now when they had departed, talking about Joseph and Mary, when they departed, an angel of the Lord, or sorry, when the... When the wise men had departed, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and says, Rise up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search. There's that word search, to seek, to, 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 to grab hold of something. As, and, and it's a focused, energetic search. For Herod is about to search for this child to destroy him. And so it's a focused, energetic, strong seeking. It's a searching with energy and commitment. Here's another way that that same word is used. This is later on when Jesus uh, when Jesus went to Jerusalem. He was about 12 years old. He went with uh, his, his family to Jerusalem. And he stayed behind in the temple, was talking to the, to the religious leaders, asking them questions. And his family left, and they didn't know that Jesus had stayed behind in the temple. And then the, his parents came back. They saw him, and they were in, 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 in here in Luke 2, verses 48 to 49. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Behold, your father and I have been searching. This is the same word. The same word was used for Herod. The same word is used for Mary and Joseph who were looking for Jesus. 
We were searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why are you searching, looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Now you can imagine any of you who are parents out there, if you lost your child, you don't know where he is, he's lost in this big city, you are gonna go frantic looking for this kid. You're gonna ask every person who knows, you don't care if it is embarrassing, you don't care if you scream and lose your voice trying to say, child, child, Jesus, where are you? Come, you know, we're looking for you. You tell everybody, you don't care how embarrassing it is. This is the strong searching. And so when it says that love is not self-seeking, it means that you're spending all your energy, all of your time, all of your thoughts, all of your energy on yourself. That's what this means. Love is not self-seeking. And it's true, we have to work and, you know, feed ourselves, clothe ourselves, and we don't... But this is kind of an over-the-top looking and searching, and everything is all about you. God says, don't be like that. First Corinthians says, don't be like that. In our relationship with God, God is never self-seeking. He doesn't do this. He doesn't just think about himself. God's not worried about himself. His heart is focused on us. His heart is focused on our benefit and our welfare and our well-being. This is who God is to us. God wants the best for us. God wants the best for you. God isn't thinking, oh, how can I get more worship out of these people? How can I do this? How can I get them to love me more? How can, no, he's just pouring out his love, pouring out his love, pouring out his love on us. He's not seeking himself or his own benefit. God isn't self-seeking. He is people-seeking. He seeks people out. He doesn't think about himself. He's like, where is these people? How can I, how can I help them? How can I bring them closer to love? How can I bring them into this community, this relationship? How can I, how can I do this? He's always thinking about people. In Luke 15, you read the whole chapter in Luke 15, there's three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost son, where God is constantly going out and looking and searching and wanting and seeking us. Not himself, but he's seeking us. So, if the Bible says, don't be self-seeking, how are we to be towards God? How can we show love and not be self-seeking to God? Well, one thing is don't always just pray for the things that you want or you need. Sometimes when we come to God and we pray, it's not so much a prayer time. It's, it's, it's like when you have a list and you go to the grocery store. Say, God, I need this. God, I need this. God, I need this. I need milk today. I need to get, my, uh, to get some eggs. I need to get some rice. I need to get this. And, and a lot of times our prayer time can just be like going to the grocery store and you have your list of groceries that you need to get. God, that's, that, that's self-seeking. You're just thinking about yourself. God says, don't, don't be like that. But how can we show love to God? And one of the ways in, in our prayer life is we can pray like Jesus prayed. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done in, on earth and in my life. Give us this day our daily bread. God, I, I trust in you. Everything that I need is in you today. Please give me just what I need for the day. Tomorrow we'll meet together again and I'll ask you again for my daily bread. It's not something where it's like, God, I need this, I need, I need, I need, I need. Give me, give me, give me. No, it's seeking, it's thinking about God and that's how our relationship with God shows love towards them, towards him. 
How can we be show love towards others in not being self-seeking? Don't think, don't spend time thinking, what can I get out of this relationship? Or what can I get out of these people? No. Seek to serve. How can I serve people? How can I lift others up? How can I help them? How can I be a blessing to them? In our relationships, if we're going to do the opposite, the Bible says love is not self-seeking. If we're going to show love in our relationships, think about how can I help that person? Look, observe their life. Think about what do they need? How can I be a blessing to them? And maybe it takes a little bit of time to watch and pray and see, but then the Holy Spirit will tell you, do this for them. Maybe bless them $10, take them out for lunch, or buy a new pair of shoes for them, or help to clean their house, or something like that. Something along the way. Be a blessing to others. Serve people. Serving people gets us out of the idea of our own self and stops us from thinking about who we are and what we want and what we need, gets us out of that. And now, okay, we're humbling ourselves to serve others. So that's how we can show this kind of love to other people. Think about others and think about what they are facing. Think about what they're going to, what they are going through. Philippians 2, 4, it says, let each of you not look only for his own interests, but also to the interests of other people. Don't look to your own interests, but also look to the interests of others. You know, it's true when we, I remember when I was a teenager, uh, one of the leaders in our church, he said, he said to me, Jason, he said, sometimes we think that we have lots of problems in our lives. And we are all worried and concerned about this and concerned about that. And, and he, said, he said, one thing that I've found, a truth that I've found, is that when I start helping other people and being a blessing to other people and help other people along their journey, I stop thinking about all of my own issues and all the stuff that's a big deal to me. And he told me that. And I remember, you know, a couple of months later, I came back to him and I said, you know what, I tried it. I said, I went and I, you know, there's a couple other kids in our youth who, in our, in our, in our church who were not serving God. And I went to them and I talked to them and had been helping them and teaching them about the Bible and just being a good friend to them. I said, you know what, I started doing this and all my problems disappeared. I stopped thinking about my own self, and, and it's so true. When we start looking at other people, all of our issues and all of our problems and all of the things that we think are a big, great, big deal, they just get so small because we're not focused on them anymore. And God helps us grow, and God helps us, helps us to change and be better people. But when we're focused on others, we can't focus also on ourselves. And this is what God wants us to do. Don't be self-seeking. This is what God wants us to do. Two more verses that I want to read. Talked about the meaning of that word, to seek, to search. It's, a, it's an energetic. It's a committed. We are always thinking about it, trying. It's, it's, it's I'm using everything that I can to, to search for this thing. And there's two other ways that, it's, that that exact same word is used in the Bible. And you'll know this one as soon as I start to read it. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Seek God's kingdom first. This is what God wants us to seek. Not self-seeking but seek his kingdom. And not just, uh, is God, God's kingdom under here? Oh, I guess, I guess I didn't find it then. 
It's not just a, you would look one time and, oh, it's not there, so I guess I can't find it. No, seeking God's kingdom is like a, a, a parent looking for his lost child. That parent is not going to give up until they find their kid. And they're looking, talking to this person. Have you seen? Calling their name. Going here, going there. Where did we go? What did we, who did we talk to? Have you seen them? They're everywhere. They're using their energy to seek. And, that, and God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. And that's what God wants us to seek. In all these things, God is our example and what we need to strive for in our lives. God is not rude to us. God is not self-seeking. So let's be like God. Let's not be scheming. Let's not just look to ourselves, but let's use our energy to, to seek God's kingdom, to seek how can I help others? How can I be a blessing to others? How can I serve other people? Get out of our own thoughts and our own mind and show agape love to God and to people who are around us as well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so very, very grateful for your word. Your word is so gentle. And it's like a seed that goes into our hearts. And God, we welcome your truth into our hearts. And we pray that the seed of your word today would go deep into our hearts so that it can start to grow. And it would start to grow, and soon we would see love growing in our own hearts. Where we'd say, whoa, I never knew that before. I never thought, I never saw that in my own life before. But now your word is true, and your word is bringing forth fruit and growing in us, oh God. So we say yes to your seed in our hearts. We say yes to your truth in our lives. God, help us to love the way that you love. Help us not to be scheming and rude. Help us not to be self-seeking, but help us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. That you didn't just leave us to figure out life all by ourselves. But you said, come on, let's go on a journey together. We'll walk together. We'll grow together. We'll see you grow. God, we thank you so much for your blessing. I want to I wanna just say to if if there's anybody out there who are, who's watching who has one never given your life to the Lord or two you've never you've maybe you've given your life to the Lord and you've kind of fallen away and want to rededicate yourself to the Lord what we're talking about is making a commitment making a commitment to God and to yourself God, I want to start walking on this journey together. I want to become a Christian. I want to, I want to begin this new life where, where the past is forgiven. And now God is in, in my life. He's entered into my life. I've received him into my life. And now we're walking together, growing and seeing great change in my life. If you've never given yourself to the Lord, if you've never made a prayer and asked the Lord to be the Lord of your life, I just want to encourage you and do two things. One, let's pray together right now. I'm going to pray, and if you want to pray this prayer with me, I would encourage you to do this. And then secondly, I'll, I'll let you know what we're going to do secondly after this. Well, let's pray together. If you're sincere about this and you pray this with your heart, God's going to be 
become the Lord of your life. The past is forgiven. The Bible calls it, it's like a, a new birth. You have a new creation. Let's pray together. Let's say these words after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are real and true and that you love me. I understand and I realize that I am a sinner. I've tried to live life my own way, but I've failed. And today, I understand about your love. And I understand that you want to forgive me and bring me into a relationship with you. So today, I say I'm sorry, God. Please forgive me. Please forgive me for all my sins. I turn away from all of that and I turn to you, the God of love. Cleanse me. Make me clean and pure. And help me to follow you and walk in this journey together with you. I love you, God. Thank you that you are my God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with all of your heart, I want to say congratulations. Congratulations. This is the best step you can take in your entire life. And that's a bold, bold first step. Secondly, I would ask you, we can never grow by ourselves. We need community around us. And so I would ask you, please contact us through Facebook or comment on YouTube or call us uh, at the phone numbers that are on the screen there available. Please, we want to walk in community with you. We want to walk, we want to know who you are. We want to be in relationship with you. And we have lots of things that we can help you do to take the next steps in your journey with God. Thank you all so very, very much. God bless you. If you need any prayer or anything, please contact us. We're here all the time. We're ready to, uh, ready to serve, ready to pray, ready to uh, help in whatever way that we can. So thank you. Thank you guys for joining together with us for our service. God bless you. God bless your week. Amen.